Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our conference on Women and Water Make Sustainable Food Security Happen. Uh, our second International Women's Day conference this year with a World Water Day twist. Um, to open the proceedings, I would like to invite on, onto stage Professor Michael McLean and uh, Ms. Marit Verhoef Cohen. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, very special event. I'd like to extend everyone a, a very warm welcome on behalf of Kate Vink, our business director, who is unfortunately ill today. But I'd like to welcome visitors that have, or who, visitors who are perhaps coming to UNESCO IG for the very first time, visitors who have been with us before. I'd like to welcome participants from our program. I'd like to welcome colleagues that have joined us this afternoon as well. As I said, it's a very special event. It's an event that is suspended between International Women's Day and World Water Day. And it's, event, it's an event that really looks at the interaction of the two. And we have a wonderful lineup of, of speakers who are going to delve into this subject and offer us the opportunity for, I believe, stimulating discussion on the topic. For those of you not familiar with UNESCO IG, this is an institution affiliated with the United Nations with the mission of training, of research, or the generation of knowledge, and the development of capacity around the world to address some of the world's most pressing and urgent water issues. And if there's one thing that we've learned through many, many years of experience, that is if we do not carefully consider gender roles and issues of equality in the solution of water resource management problems, in the provision of water and all that comes with it, we're likely to fail. So this is a critical issue. And it's one that we've actually opened up. Uh, we've suspended classes to provide opportunities for our participants to join in because it's that urgent. And today, we're addressing one of the most critical problems related to this, and that's the provision of water to meet the world's growing need for food. So an extraordinarily important topic to consider. And we're not doing it alone. We're doing it in partnership with Women for Water Partnership. So I'd like to invite Marit to also welcome you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, well, as co-host, as you just heard of this international uh, Women's Day conference, uh, it is really a great pleasure for Women for Water Partnership to officially welcome you all here uh, in Delft, which is uh, the uh, UNESCO um, home uh, home for uh, all the water, water students and water researchers. Women for Water, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Women for Water, why are we here, and that is we are a global alliance of women organizations and networks working on the broad issues of water, sustainable development and gender nexus. Our common denominator is universal access to water for all and for all users. And we use that as a springboard for women's empowerment and their social and economic development. We embody the uh, diversity of women's civil society, thus creating a strong, reliable and influential network in which women act as agents of change in the water and the development sector. The global water crisis is a result of mismanagement of water resources and often a lack of efficient water governance and structures. Therefore, it is essential that women are present in the decision-making levels of the water management. Gender equity is a precondition for equitable water resources management and human development opportunities for both women and men. So special attention is required to women's empowerment in the water and development sector. Thus, a partnership with Women for Water Partnership is crucial in order to advocate 
for gender equity, increase women's involvement and tap the full potential of their contribution to the water and development uh, agenda. Before going on um, and on on what we are doing, um, that is absolutely not the objective and I would like to once more emphasize that uh, gender equity in the water sector is key to overcome main challenges uh, in this sector and the sector that is facing um, these challenges. And you just heard that uh, UNESCO IEJ is doing the same thing. Uh, Women for Water Partnership uses water as an entry point to gender. Hence, we combine the theme of the Water, uh, the International Water Day, World Water Day 2015, which was uh, Water and Sustainable Development, with the theme for International Women's Day 2015, which is Make It Happen. So looking at the scope of these two themes, you will clearly see the linkage between UNESCO IEJ and uh, Women for Water Partnership. And that is why we organized the annual women's conference with, um, as it said in the, uh, in the um, inter introduction, uh, with a World Water Day twist. And that is how we came up with this, uh, this important theme. So I wish you all a very enjoyable afternoon and I hope to be talking to you after, uh, after this conference. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Marie. Well, if you've looked at the program, you see that we have uh, three speakers, uh, leading individuals in this theme. We have approximately two hours together. Our speakers have prepared presentations that are between 20 and 25 minutes, which will ideally leave plenty of time for discussion. So please, as you listen to the presentations, as ideas and, and questions come up, save them and be sure to introduce them into the conversation when we reach the discussion. I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, Ms. Ilaria Sisto, Gender and Development Officer in the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO. Ilaria, I see that you've been with FAO since approximately 1990. Prior to that, you were at an institute of the National Research Council in Italy. You also spent time in the United States at the University of California, Davis. I believe that's where you uh, also obtained a Master of Science degree in horticulture. And in your role with FAO, you've been working really around the world, in Chile, in Mexico, in Guatemala, and of course in Rome, which makes us all very envious. <laughs> but I'd like to invite you to the stage, and you can introduce uh, the topic the, of your talk and Thank begin. You. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today. The topics that we are going to discuss today are extremely close to my heart. A few days ago, I received a medal of 25 years in FAO. My parents used to work in FAO as well, so I'm a child of FAO. And the uh, topics of women and water are the closest to my heart for many, many years. I've been traveling all over the world. Uh, I've been in base in Rome now for 20 years, but I've been traveling maybe 10 or 12 times a year around the world. In, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, UNESCO and the Women for uh, Water Partnership to invite us to this event. And we are very happy to share some of the experiences that FAO has accumulated in this area and also some of the things that we are trying to do. Uh, my presentation is uh, How Can Women Control Water? Action Needed to Increase Agriculture Productivity and ensure food and nutrition security. I decided to add also nutrition because as you are aware, recently we had our second international conference on nutrition, and it's not only an issue to ensure that people have food, but they have nutritious food. And we need to be very careful about that as well. And uh, the idea that we would like to try to see how we can increase women's access to productive resources if we really want to address hunger and poverty. <laughs> Uh, a lot of the issues, uh, uh, these issues is extremely important because um, 
Uh, there are many concerns regarding women, and not only women because we want to be nice to women, but because we want to be nice to all of us. Because if women are able to produce more and to have access to resources and services and institution and employment and so on, the benefit will be for the whole household, for the community, for the society as a whole. So everybody will actually benefit. And uh, there are so many constraints that the women are still facing. For example, let me give you an example. In the case of uh, organization, why do women cannot participate in organization? And there are many different reasons why they can also not be part of decision making. For example, the fact that they have uh, uh, the membership very often is confined only to one member in the household. The fact that very often to be part of an organization you need to own land, and very often women do not own that. Or the fact that very often people working in organization are very insensitive to gender issues, so there it's where we need to do something specifically. Also, agricultural activity are perceived as masculine. I remember when I decided to study agriculture engineering in Florence, people were saying, you are a woman, why do you do that? Can you not do something better, like a, uh, some other activities that are more linked for women? And also the fact, and I think that's something where UNESCO can play a very important role, is the fact that women still face very low education level and uh, literacy level, and also the local tradition don't allow them to move as much as they would like to and we would like to do. In my presentation, I would like to focus on four different areas. First of all, I would like to explain what we call our business case. Why we need to address gender equality to ensure agricultural productivity and food and nutrition security. Then I would like to explain a little bit about uh, what is our experience and I will provide you with some details. What I would like to say in my presentation that I left with the organizer, I included a lot of speaker notes with concrete example in case people want to know more because I will not have time to go into a lot of details, but you can find some more details in the presentation. Then I would like to share with you some of the available tools and what we see as our way forward. If we look at agriculture, agriculture is the biggest user of water. It accounts for almost 70 of all the withdrawals of water and up to 95% in developing countries. Water is essential for food security, and uh, people with better access to water have also lower levels of undernourishment, especially when they depend on local agriculture for food and income. Also, something that we are working more and more is the issues of time poverty. They say, oh, they're poor, but they're poor of time. Very often women have to, catch, uh, have to fetch water and wood, and it takes so much time. So there is a big issue also related to labor efficiency and how we can help to reduce the work burden. Also, our main issue in FAO is how we can increase the productivity of water. And so how can we produce more crop for our drop? As you can see, more crop for the drop. Uh, something that we are always dealing with our colleagues, uh, especially techni technical people who are working like agriculture engineers and other colleagues, very often they see only the technological part. And we say technology is one aspect, but the other one are people. If you can be producing the most innovative technologies and uh, the most advanced and everything, but if the farmers who are supposed to use these are not involved in the process, they don't have access to this technology, that doesn't make really sense. So I always think technology and people have to go hand in hand. Also, if we want to see... Uh, uh, why uh, uh, the importance of irrigation. We know that irrigation can, the highest yields from irrigation can obtain more than uh, double the yields and uh, you can obtain from uh, rain-fed agriculture. But irrigation very often is not available to small-scale uh, farmers in many developing countries. And also with irrigation you need to be very careful because it needs to be managed efficiently and needs to be also combined with other inputs like uh, fertilizer, improved, improved seed varieties and other issues. Let's look at the situation in the world. Uh, a lot of progress has been made, and uh, especially with uh, issues related to water, to food security and so on, but the situation is still pretty dramatic as you can see. Uh, your right to food is considered a universal human rights and everybody should have the right to food but we have over 800 million people who still don't have it. 
and it's, that means one in nine still suffer from uh, problems related to food insecurity. If we look at nutrition, according to the latest data, we have over two billion people who are suffering from mal macronutrients <coughs> deficiency, or what they call uh, hidden hunger. And at the same time, we have over half a billion of people who are obese. So that's also malnutrition. <coughs> malnutrition is so many different areas that you have to consider. Water. Uh, they were very proud with the Millennium Development Goals, so we made so much progress uh, for the Millennium Development Goals 7, because so many people were able to uh, uh, have access to safe drinking water. But still, uh, two-thirds of the world population live in uh, water-stressed countries, I expect about 2025. So, big issues to do. What can be done to ensure a water-secure world? There are many different issues. First of all, we need to make sure that everybody has access to drink, safe drinking water. At the same time, sanitation. Last year, in this period, I was invited by the Asian Development Bank in Manila, and something that kept coming out in the discussion on women, water, and leadership was the issues of sanitation. Why so many people don't have access to that, and how many diseases, and how many implications you might have on that. Also hygiene, the fact also that you need to have a sustainable management and development of the water resources. You need to protect your aquatic biological resources. Uh, wastewater management and water quality are also extremely important. If you look at the sustainable development goal, what is our role? We are involved in three, we co-lead three of these uh, sustainable development goals that I mentioned there. The first one on food security, nutrition, and sustainable agriculture. The second one on marine resources, oceans, and seas. And the third one is on ecosystem and biodiversity. And we contribute also to some others. As I mentioned, water for us is also extremely important. We think that any of the post-2015 framework that will be developed has to have water at the center. And that implies all the other activity related to food security, nutrition, sustainable development, and so on. Here you can see the list of our targets that uh, we would like to uh, achieve related to the sustainable development goal. And all of them have very strong uh, uh, water implication. For example, in the case of the first target, all people have access to adequate food all year round. Uh, if you want to have food, you need to have water. So that comes hand in hand. Or if you want to end malnutrition, you need to make sure water safety is there. Because it's not only having water, but having good quality water. If not, you, uh, you don't absorb nutrients and you have even more problems. Or if you want to make sure that all food production systems become more productive and sustainable, I think it's extremely important that we look at the linkages between sustainable food system and water scarcity and how to overcome issues related to water and, and so on. So you can see also that, for example, reduce uh, food loss and waste rate by 50%. Even there, good water management can also have important repercussion on, uh, on reducing food losses. So uh, what FAO is doing? Uh, we have decided a few years ago to focus our work around what we call five strategic objectives that you can see here. The first one is more the policy level, where you look into eliminate uh, hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition. Here, for example, our work is related to the CEDO, for example, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And now we are looking into this uh, as part of the celebration for this year for food, uh, uh, food Security uh, Committee on the issues of women and uh, water governance. That's something extremely important for us. We started a study recently, and some colleagues are also involved in this here. Uh, also, the second aspect is related to agriculture to make it more productive and sustainable. And here we had the interesting discussion with our colleagues because they said, gender comes with social sustainability, and we said no. Gender comes with social, economic, and environmental sustainability because it's related to everything. The fact that women don't have income, they don't have access to employment and so on has implication also for the economic aspect of sustainability, to environment. The fact that women have a unique knowledge about conservation of natural resources and biodiversity is also extremely important. Then rural poverty to be reduced, 
Also the fourth one, how to invest in agriculture and what we call the value chain and the food system. And the last one is related to, uh, to disaster and how to build resilience. And the agenda is considered cross-cutting issue. So in all the activities we say you will never be able to achieve any of these objectives unless you don't make sure that the gender aspects are taken into account. A few years ago, in 2011, we decided to dedicate our uh, state of food and agriculture to women in agriculture. And that was uh, our business case. And we looked at all the data we were able to find related to <coughs> sex disaggregated data. And I must say that's not always easy because a lot of information is not really adequately uh, disaggregated. For example, to distinguish between the situation of women in uh, female-headed households that can be the youth or the fact, or the fact that they depend from a man who might be sending remittances, or the fact that a woman can be alone or can be single or divorced or widow. It's difficult sometimes to distinguish between the different uh, situations where women are, are living and the different type of households. Uh, also, data is still quite limited, and so I think a lot of work needs to be done more in this area. But if we look at the situation, 43% of the agricultural labor force uh, is, uh, is represented by women. Uh, in Latin America, it's about 20%. Uh, about 20%. In case of East and Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, we go up to 50%. Uh, in the poorest country, uh, about 60% of all employed women are working in agriculture. Uh, there are a lot of issues related to labor, the fact that, for example, women, if they have jobs, they have uh, low-paid jobs, part-time, seasonal, they don't have very often what we call decent employment, the fact they don't have all the benefits, and so there are a lot of repercussion. Here you can see some data related that we presented in our SOFA in 2011, where we show the situation of women and land, and it seems that women on be to control between 3 to 20 percent of agricultural land in developing countries. And uh, even when they own land, they usually the land is a smaller, uh, smaller plots of land of inferior quality with less secure tenure. This year is the International Year of Soil, and they say, oh, women should invest more in soil fertility, but do they have the incentive to do that? Do they, have the, do they own the land that they want really to invest in that soil fertility? And there are many issues that we have to consider. We have calculated that uh, women uh, they usually produce uh, less than men and, uh, because they don't have the same access to resources, to services, and there is a substantial difference in the, in the, in the years from women, uh, produced by women and men. And if you are able to reduce this uh, gender gap that exists in agriculture, you could uh, increase the yields of women by 2.5 to 4 percent. And uh, this would uh, imply that uh, we could reduce the number of unnourished people in the world by 12 to 17 percent. We calculated in 2011, when we did this study, we had about 925 million people undernourished. And if you were able to reduce this gap, the gender gap, you could bring out of poverty, uh, out of uh, undernourishment, between 100 and 150 million people. So we are not talking about small numbers. And if you want to know more about the SOFA, we will be happy to, to share with you. <coughs> Countries have said that they wanted to have some, uh, for the work related to FAO, they wanted to have also some objective for gender equality. First, we were thinking about gender equity, but countries said, no, 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 let's want to aim at gender equality, exactly the same opportunity for men and women. And so after about two years of negotiation and consultation, we came up to our five objectives. They are quite uh, important. The first one is related to equal participation of women and men as decision makers in institutions and in shaping laws and programs. The second one is uh, access to decent employment, income, land, water, and other resources. The third one is related to services and goods. And then there are two that are seen like a nightmare for a lot of people. And uh, one of the objectives that we would like to obtain by 2017, and we are getting close to that, is we would like to reduce the women's work burden by 20%. And we would also like to see that agriculture aid 
is thirty uh, percent of it uh, by countries or institutions or uh, different uh, partners. Thirty percent of it is dedicated to women and gender issues. Some countries we have seen have started making big progress in that, and they are very committed to do that. So this is what we want to do. And last week, or last Friday, there was a, a, a celebration for Women's Day by FAO World Food Program and IFAD in Rome. And there, one of the issues that came out, one of the lessons, is that we have done so much in, since Beijing 2015 and, and 1995, but in 20 years, still women in rural areas are facing huge problems. And if you look at all the indicators, also the MDGs and so on, with the exception of education, for most of them, women are still quite disadvantaged. And much more needs to be done. Also, if you want to talk about sustainable food system, you need to make sure that men and women equally participate and can benefit from it. And uh, you need to consider what could be the different roles the men and women have and how to make sure that you can obtain sustainable food system and value chain and so on, giving the right uh, um, access to resources and services and employment and opportunities to both men and women. Our experiences, we have been working for many years on this issue. Since I was created, we had a women's group, then we became a gender division, and now we are called a social protection division. And, uh, and uh, within this division, we are also dealing with gender. And uh, here you can see what kind of experiences we have been trying to provide uh, and uh, what kind of assistance we have been trying to provide to countries. Technical assistance, and let me give you some example. Uh, we have done in several countries a very in-depth analysis of what are the gender needs and impacts in multiple use of water services. For example, crops, domestic purposes, home gardens, and livestock, and so on. And the idea was to try to see how we could uh, consider this analysis to modernize large irrigation system. And here we try to see what kind of uh, both functional and technical skills we needed to strengthen. For example, the fact that you invest in women's self-confidence, in their negotiation skills, or what we call like the soft skills, and try to make sure that women were also participating in, organ in producer organization. In some countries, like in Pakistan, we work very closely in the Sindh uh, province in uh, modernization of the irrigation system in what we call gender-sensitive technology and infrastructure. I remember there was a case when I went there they wanted to, the women want to have a little bridge, simple, 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 so that they could go much quicker to the market. And they had these very fantastic irrigation canals, very sophisticated, and the women said, you know, the canals are very nice, but we need to walk three hours on one side and to cross, and then another three hours to come back. And can we not have a little bridge, tiny, simple bridge, so that they can go to the market in half an hour instead of three hours in each way? Uh, also, uh, in other cases, for example, uh, I remember in China, uh, the women said, you know, we are working about disaster risk prevention with the floods and all the problems related to that. Can we have a role to play? And we said, what would you like to do? And they said, we would like to be involved in the maintenance and operation of the canals. And the fact that they started being involved more in that, then they were part of the village community council and they were part of the preparedness. And so then slowly, slowly they were in power and they were, their role were recognized. Institutional strengthening, very often the support can be, for example, to support establishing a women association and then once the women are better organized among themselves, then they can participate in more formal organization. And so you provide them with a different hints. So in some cases, pushing to have a fixed quota, like in water user organizations and a different type of activity that can be done. A lot of countries keep saying that the most important element is produce evidence for policymakers, and so sex disaggregated data is extremely important. And then uh, we have had a whole series of projects related to networking and information sharing. One is the JWAMED project. It's a project funded by the European Union in all the countries around the Mediterranean. And there they create a national and regional networks of uh, institutions working with gender and uh, with women and water. Uh, they created a list of indicators and also something that I thought it was very interesting. They created what they call observ national observatories of female entrepreneurship. So they wanted to see in Italy and in Lebanon 
which women were more uh, dominant as a developing little enterprises, what kind of enterprises could be more supported, how women could play a different role in value chain, and a whole series of things. And that's something that's uh, very interesting that was developed. Capacity development, as you can see here, there are a lot of things related to capacity development. Uh, very often, because we are uh, an international organization, we can also uh, have an important role in raising awareness of policymakers. And there you need to produce the evidence. So you need to build, uh, identify good practices, not only to say you need to do the gender work, but also to say how they can do it. I always keep dreaming that I would like to have one day a recipe book of good uh, governance options on how to ensure that men and women have the same access to land and water. So one day, instead of having a cooking recipe, I will have a book on men and women and how they can access more access to land and water. Also, issues related to training women to become irrigation leaders. I saw one of them in Afghanistan. One person who participated in one of our training decided, you know, I need to invest in women to become irrigation engineer in Afghanistan. And I see a huge role for them. And I went to Afghanistan, I visit, and it was amazing, step by step, very slowly, but what kind of things you could be doing. Also make sure that when you design irrigation schemes, you try to address the gender dimension, support or association like Water User Association and Women's Group. In data, as I said, is always extremely important for us. One of the things that I remember was very interesting in a country like Tunisia, the issue to empower the women was to give them a fishing license. Women never had had any identification document in very poor areas of Tunisia. And uh, we gave them a fishing uh, license, and that was the beginning of a very long way for empowerment and like a successful story. They felt that a fishing license was a document, they existed, they had an identity, and then slowly they had legal advice to create a women's association. Then they participate in cooperative for the development of fisheries. And now the women collecting clams in Tunisia are really making big progress. Indicators, we are working very closely with a UNESCO working group uh, who, is, uh, who has set up an organization, or a, a group to identify gender sensitive uh, water monitoring, assessment and reporting. And uh, this is an example of some of the indicators that we have proposed for the agriculture sector. For example, how many, the percentage of irrigated farms that are managed or owned by women and men, the average size of irrigated farms run by men and women. Also, here it's very important, we always say it's not only quantitative data, but also qualitative data. You need to ask the women and the men how they feel about it. Do they feel that the discrimination is making any progress or is getting worse? and what can be done. Something very interesting on this, FAO has recently issued some new guidelines on social and environmental management, where they have standards to make sure that your projects are not creating any harm. And one of the standards of these new guidelines that were issued a few days ago were on gender. And we need to make sure that our projects are not making more damage than anything. So you need to be very careful how you're addressing the gender issues in your project, whatever type of project you have. Also, something about support to services and so on. An experience that is very interesting, recently we have a project that is called Dimitra. We have been having that for, with the Belgian cooperation for the last 10 years. And uh, it's mainly working on women leadership and self-confidence. They have what they call the Dimitra uh, clubs or listener clubs. They use mobile and rural radios. And uh, they have been able really to empower and organize women in a lot of countries. In Niger, recently, the women were able to negotiate a 99-year lease of land. And so that has been able to, to, to be achieved through a little uh, rural radio program that the women had uh, set up in a little community. Or in the case of Niger, there is, is a zero hunger campaign, and they have created a program where the Nigerian want to feed the Nigerian. And there, again, they try to see what kind of empowerment, what are the perception of people and how to, to move on uh, forward and how to change behaviors and attitudes and change the roles. For the policy, uh, we have been working in different areas. 
always, not always successfully. And the first one was a project where I coordinated in the, all the Lusophone countries. And there what we did, we looked at all the legislation and policies and laws related to land and water for three countries, in Angola, Cape Verde, and Mozambique. And we made very concrete recommendations on how the gender dimension could be addressed. And to be honest, I feel this is a document sitting in the shelf of someone because there was not so much of a commitment to do something. Maybe Mozambique was more interested to do something, but sometimes, I don't know, it's one of those efforts that you try to promote, but if there is no real political commitment to make a change, then not really much happens. In the case of the, uh, there is an African group that has uh, set up a, a, it's called the African Council, a Minister Council on Water, and they have developed what is their policy and strategy for mainstreaming gender in the water sector in Africa. And there again, with UNESCO and many other organizations, we were able to set up a list of indicators to monitor if these African countries are really making any progress or not. Another initiative is uh, the, what we call the paralegals. In Mozambique and other countries, we have selected people in the community who had a higher education. They went through major training and now these are like paralegal, and they go and assist poor people in the community to negotiate for their land and water <coughs> rights. And this model seems to be quite interesting for other countries as well, and also try to invest in women leaders. These are some of the tools. You're more than welcome to review them. We have an irrigation guide that we developed many years ago, uh, where we have identified some participatory tools for socioeconomic and gender analysis, we have a checklist, and this is a little passport that uh, we developed with the General Water Alliance and colleagues from the project in the Mediterranean. Uh, there is a MASMUS model that's like an auditing uh, approach that we was developed a few years ago, and now we are trying to consolidate it, and a whole series of other things. The passport is checklist, uh, and I leave some copy here to the colleague in UNESCO for the library, is structured around checklists or key questions that people can ask to make sure that gender issues are taken into account. The way forward, we first decided we wanted to carry out this study that we recently started with some consultants looking into women and water governance. We decided to focus on the water scarcity in the Near East, but uh, in North Africa, but uh, we hope that we can identify also some good case studies from other regions. Uh, also try to create an enabling environment, for example, trying to see what are new forms of organization to uh, assist more men and women in the supply chains. Uh, we are trying to uh, see how we can strengthen the capacity and invest in, the, in, in training and in, uh, in collective action, networking, building self-confidence, support uh, women's political empowerment and also try to generate uh, knowledge and uh, evidence for policy makers. Uh, for example, uh, to try to promote some changes in the regulation, like in the producer organization. A lot of work is also being carried out in the areas of policy advice. Uh, we hope that in the future we can continue assisting country with the review of the legislation. We have a land and, and gender database that was developed with information for over 80 countries. Uh, we are identifying good practices from my recipe book I mentioned before, and also trying to see how we can support countries in the implementation of the international commitments. We have uh, several organizations that are collaborating with us in uh, this labor efficiency, and we want to reduce the women's poverty, uh, women's work burden, and so we are trying to invest in technologies and services to support them. And finally, we hope that we can continue investing in women's leadership through exchange visits, like learning routes, like IFA has done, or the Dimitra with his listener club, or different ways. And in the last slide, I have included a list of references that I mentioned in case people are interested to know more about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elias. Paul is clearly playing a very important role. If you could wait for just a moment, let's... Uh, Take a question or two from the audience. Who would like to begin? Yes, please. Uh, what do you feel is the main accomplishment of FAO over the past 20 years? Mm. Mm. 
we know we know that there are a lot of things aren't going exactly the way we like them. But are there things that you feel are encouraging and that those are the ones that we should? A lot a lot of the things related to um, to this uh, capacity development in the broader sense. There is not only training, but generating the data, disseminating the data so that you can convince policymakers and provide policy advice. Uh, with uh, I think that's something extremely important. Uh, the things, for example, of uh, this, uh, like the SOFA 2011, where you can build a business case and say, you know, you can do whatever you want. They are talking about sustainable food system and so on, but if you don't address the gender dimension, nothing will ever happen. So we keep producing examples. We have colleagues who have recently done a study on the livestock in Afghanistan to see how the livestock value chain uh, without addressing the gender dimension will be a big failure. We are producing similar analysis of the value chain in other countries, like in Ethiopia and a few other countries at the same time. I think the things of collecting information, disseminating it, is extremely important. The fact that we are in a neutral forum is extremely important. The fact that you can have people from different sectors sitting around the table and discuss issues is extremely important. I've seen, for example, all these big conferences that we organize at the beginning, like the private sector, NGOs who are sitting in one little corner, isolated, now they're all part of the big discussion. These things of the partnership, I think, is a huge potential. Very often, the results that you would like to have, you don't obtain it, but there are so many elements that go against you. Climate change, and uh, all these conflicts, and, uh, and uh, water scarcity, and lack of commitment, and I don't know, there are so many. So sometimes you think you're doing big progress, but then you can't go in the right direction because something comes up conflicts or the natural disaster. So many countries go from one disaster to the other. I remember once I was in uh, Vietnam recently and they said, you know, we used to have one flood a year, now we have up to eight a year. Or countries who go through droughts, they never come out of it. And then when they're overcoming very slowly the big crisis, a new one comes. It's like, wow. But uh, I don't know. Uh, you don't have the magic stick, but you try, and uh, you can support in a lot of this activity. I think uh, the fact of uh, discussing issues like this international conference on nutrition, bringing to the table what is the situation, uh, and what can be done. They have, all the countries have signed a framework for action and a declaration where there is a very strong commitment to invest like in education and nutrition and a lot of things. I think those type of things are quite relevant. I still believe in it after 25 years. <laughs> so some important progress, some big challenges, and some really difficult questions from the audience. <laughs> Do I have a question? No. Yes, sir. Um, nutrition. I'm surprised that uh, FAO and the World Health Organization, talking about nutrition, try to incorporate uh, or introduce in China, for example, potatoes, while they don't have a tradition to do with it, diseases, and so on. Uh, if I look at the, your nice picture about the rice, uh, why white rice, white bread, where with energy and time we reduce the minerals, the vitamins, the fibers. Huh? Uh, so to reduce a wonderful nutritious food, reduce it to, to just uh, hydrocarbon. Uh, I never have seen a program of FAO together with the World Health Organization to address the problem. Mm. I'm, I'm not working directly in that division, so unfortunately I would not be able to... No, I'm not blaming you. But no, 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 but uh, I would love to uh, share this question with another colleague who are working directly in that. I'm not involved in it, so I wouldn't be able to... But you could inspire them, I mean, with economic and social development. I mean, it, it's time that you as uh, main organization introduce this consciousness in the world. Yeah. But uh, there are so many political issues behind. There is not so, so many interests, so many things. And I can see, for example, the Rome Declaration for the Nutrition. It took so much time just to negotiate a simple document. 
and to have all the countries, all the different sectors and everybody in agreement that it's not as easy as you can yeah. imagine. Do, do you see your reaction? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you are understanding already the existing situation. Which you can score very easily with this. Mm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, this, 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 this is exactly the kind of uh, the kind of uh, you know in depth and challenging discussion that fora like this provide the opportunity for. One more, and then I, I want to. We need to save time for our other speakers and questions for them as well. How, uh, how accessible is power sources and expertise for a small scale farmers? All our, our main counterpart uh, is the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Minister of Agriculture in the country. For example, if you want to have a project or anything, you need to go through the Minister of Agriculture and they have to say this is a priority where we can support or not. And so in some cases we, we have a quite large group that deals with the NGOs and with the uh, civil society and they are trying to organize a lot of activity. but the final decision on what kind of support you can give to a certain organization in a country and so on has to come directly from the country itself. Thank you very much. We're off to a great start, but I'd like to invite you up, Mari, to introduce our next speaker so we can continue um, introducing a new topic, continuing the discussion, and remember that we'll have a little bit of time at the end and time together during the reception to continue these conversations. Thank you very much. This is very interesting, and it's not a new topic. It's it, uh, it's an addition. Um, three years ago, the board of uh, trustees of the HAS, which is uh, in Den Bosch University of Applied Sciences, appointed uh, Frederike Basterink uh, as member to the board of governors uh, with the portfolio Knowledge Development. The main motive for the board at that time. Uh, was their ambition to continue working to develop into a dedicated center of excellence in green economy and society. So maybe some of your questions can also be answered by Frederick. After uh, studying horticulture at uh, Wageningen University, Frederick uh, Pastoring first worked, worked at two research development departments in the business sector, then she gained extensive international experience at the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, where you just heard what 25 years of experience uh, means. And for the FAO, she worked in countries like Asia, Central and Eastern Europe, and the Middle East. Friedrich Pastoring uh, started working at Haas in Den Bosch as program leader, food, health and health, and as lecturer, sustainable sustainability, and later as a lecturer, sustainable food security. Within the lectureship, she worked on knowledge development in preservation and internationalizing for education and service in the profession. So Frederick is expert in sustainable food security, as a optimist, she knows about gender, and I'm convinced that we will listen with great interest to her presentation of sustainable food security, making it happen. Thanks for being here, Frederick, and for sharing your experience on this subject. All right, so, well, good afternoon and thanks for the opportunity to be able to uh, do a presentation for, uh, for you all today. <laughs> have to get my orientation here. Um, just out of curiosity, um, how many students are in here? Okay, and how many water students? No. <laughs> <laughs> Approximately the same. How many of you are in agriculture or food? Okay, three, four, five. Good, good, good. All right, so that's nice. That's very good. Um, I have a presentation and I have, yeah, 
this is a few introductory, but it's already been mentioned uh, that I worked with FAO, etc. So there is a little mixture of the experiences of FAO during my 15 years of service for the FAO and uh, the, the work I'm doing now for Haas University of Applied Sciences. Just shortly, what is Haas University of Applied Sciences? Does, did, everybody, did somebody already know Haas University of Applied Sciences? Mm. One of you? Two, three, four, ah, it's growing, it's growing. How about Wageningen University? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Any, any alumni from Wageningen? Or, yeah, two, three, good. Myself. <laughs> four. Okay, anybody who's studying there right now? Or perhaps following the MOOC that they do on food security? There you go. All right, there's lots of things happening in the green domain on food security, so that's really good. Um, but this is Haas. Haas and Boss is the applied level, so it's not the academic level, but it's the applied level of science. Uh, we have ten, um, 10 study programs, all bachelor study programs, um, and we have um, 28,100 uh, students, and we have 20 nationalities. So a lot of uh, international students, are not, not so many, but a few in the two of the study programs that are English uh, taught. Okay, enough. Um, what am I going to talk about today? I've been thinking, because most of you are international students coming from another country, I thought I might as well talk a little bit about the Dutch agri-food system, so that, and then uh, talk about the global developments and about food security, but with the relation to the Dutch, um, Dutch exams, the Dutch work. A little bit about innovations, a few examples, just to, you know, to get things uh, going. And then one take-home message that has nothing to do with the rest of the presentation. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. From a didactical point of view, it's not good. <laughs> but uh, I thought I might try it with you. All right. This is the Netherlands. And those of you who have done some touristy things, this is we promote ourselves with the tulips, the windmills, the famous Frisian cows in the cheese. But a lot of people don't know that behind those screens is a very, very high-tech, a very, very sophisticated agro and food sector with breeding, lots of breeding um, companies, with a lot of really high-tech production facilities and with integrated uh, approaches such as left, which is an aerial photo taken from a poultry farm in the south of the Netherlands. I took it actually myself. And whilst I was hanging in a huge sort of, I don't know how you call this, a construction thing with a cage and you can, you know, we're flying over this to see all the solar panels. This is almost self-supporting uh, in terms of energy, but they uh, produce eggs, eggs from chicken, huge quantity of eggs. This sector is so much uh, technically supplied that almost no people work in it. I think about 5 to 6% of our labor force in the Netherlands work actually works in the agro and food sector. Um, and uh, if you know that almost 10% of our gross national product is made out of uh, agro and food, it's a huge difference. This is because of the mechanization and the way we have been able to increase the productivity per kilo of land, per uh, hectare of land, uh, per man hour. A lot of mechanization and a lot of uh, high-tech production systems. We also in the Netherlands have a green educational system with vocational applied and scientific level. Scientific is only Wageningen, but uh, vocational and applied there are more uh, schools and universities of applied sciences with scientific with courses and with a lot of research. That's good. We work together quite a bit, especially when it comes to international cooperation. So the Dutch have a vital economic sector in the agro and food. I mentioned already the 10%, and uh, it's a very, very important sector. Yet, lots of people don't know this, even the Dutch people. There's a lot of un, um, you know, knowledge, lack of knowledge about how big we actually are in agro and food. And I'm, I'm not sure if uh, has any body of you went to Alsmeer, to the flower auctions? Yeah. I recommend you go there once. On a weekend day or perhaps it's really nice to see great pictures 
is all the flowers that go there, the trade of flowers is huge, it's immense. And there you can actually experience and feel the vast, the vastness of this agro and food sector of the Dutch. This small country, you can hardly see it and you can hardly find it on a map, is the second exporter of agro and food products worldwide. It's amazing. It's really amazing. Yeah. So go to Alsmeer once and go to Rotterdam. I mean, you see, and if you uh, are in the highway, every third truck that you see is filled with agro and food products. Every third. Turf it. You, you, will, you can check. Yeah. And this is the way our consumers in the Netherlands choose their food. Plenty, plenty of food. Our biggest problem is which of these 37 yogurts we will choose for dessert. And since this is so difficult, the boy is get to choose. And how does he choose? He chooses what he can see, and he chooses the latest cartoon or the, the, the best picture on the label. And this is how we compete. Lots of food. We spend about 10 to 15 percent of our uh, salary or income in the Netherlands on food relatively low um, the value of food not just the economic value but the general value in food is low we don't value it as much as some other countries where you have to spend maybe 60% of your salary on food but not everywhere as you know is food glossy, shiny and fully available as it is in the Netherlands. There are three issues that I would like to, t to pass through. One of them is food security. Um, it's already been mentioned by my colleague from FAO, too much and too little. So malnutrition has two sides and the second side, the too much, is becoming bigger and bigger issue. And illustrated by this picture, a little bit shocking perhaps to see this, um, but people like this can have both obesity and malnutrition, lack of micronutrients. And this is becoming more and more an issue in urbanized uh, cities in a number of Asian countries, for example, uh, where people are obese and uh, nutrition deficiency. So it's very complex uh, to know this and to deal with this. Um, and um, it, it adds to the too little food. So the, the relation between food and health is becoming more and more of an issue. And I agree with I think it was you, um, that FAO, but not just FAO, but all organizations should work much more together with the production side, but also the consumption and the health sector uh, to make a crossover. The crossover between food and health is a really, really a major issue, also in the Netherlands, but everywhere. And it's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. The second one is waste and losses. You know, this food waste and losses, the FAO has calculated that about one-third of all food produced does not reach the plate, either because it's lost in the field or at post-harvest or transport, or it is wasted at the consumer or the retail level. And the retail and consumer level is much more in the Western countries, like the Netherlands, Europe and the US, um, and at the field level, before it actually reaches um, reaches the, the, the plates is already wasted and that's the majority of uh, developing countries where the food or the harvest is not what it could have been a lot of a big issue is this <coughs> and the third one is the scarcity the growing scarcity of raw materials that we're just facing not just land not just water the major source for uh, agriculture as we have learned just now uh, but also phosphate for fertilizer, which is a mined uh, ingredient, and a lot of earth metals, they become scarce due to sustainable development. Uh, for example, uh, using smartphone, electric cars, solar panels, all need some earth materials that have been digging out uh, of the soil, and uh, they've become, they become scarce. So this uh, calls for action, and it calls for a, a process that is very strong in at least in the Netherlands, but in a lot of other countries, it's called a circular economy, uh, where you don't have the linear economy, like you, you dive, you produce something, and then you waste it at the end. But the circular economy means that we have to take out 
the ingredients, the raw materials, the, the molecules that we can then reuse in another um, series of products, not just food, but also non-food products. Um, it is my belief that we have worked for the last century, century and a half, FAO, Wageningen, Haas University, we have worked and focused on productivity of our agricultural uh, land. We have worked on agricultural production per, per land unit, per man hour, per, per man hour, and per unit input. So per kilo of fertilizer, per kilo of water, per liter of water. Those were the things we have been focusing on. To me, the next century will focus on productivity of materials. It's a totally different concept. We're not ready for this, but small issues, small um, projects and small initiatives will, will get there and will eventually um, turn the mainstream over into this system, is my belief. Three issues already now, but in the next 40 years, we need to produce, according to FAO, about 70% more food than the last 6,000 years combined because of the growing world population, because of the growing um, economic development, which in itself is a good thing, but people start to eat more meat, more dairy products, which require a lot more resources uh, like land and uh, grain meat. Diminishing arable land due to urbanization, due to unsustainable food production and agricultural practices, and due to um, climate change. For example, in uh, Syria, Lebanon, where I worked, uh, every year 7%, 7 of their agricultural land is lost by the effects of climate change. 7% doesn't seem a lot, but if you come there one year, and the year after that, you come and agricultural land has been taken out of production because it has turned into desert. It's really sad. It's really sad. So water availability is crucial for food production. And it becomes more, more and more crucial in the future. And also, I have to admit, I was there myself doing it, but um, also working on it to make it more sustainable. Actually, in FAO, the program I worked is an IPM program, Integrated Pest Management, working for well, 50 years of my life uh, to reduce the effects, the negative effects of the Green Revolution that you know we, we take as a success story because the productivity in Asia, for example, of rice and of a few major food crops were very much increased, but at the same time, uh, pesticide residues in groundwater um, poisoning uh, issues with humans and um, a lot of negative impacts. So FAO works very hard to make agriculture more, more sustainable. And not just FAO, but a lot of other organizations. Fortunately, because we need all people. How? I'm going to show you a slightly difficult schedule here. And it might, you know, be... Um, the answer that was one of the questions for why this FAO does not, uh, what, what would be the success story of FAO? And FAO, I remember I worked in FAO and I worked in Bhutan, a small country in the Himalayas. And I came back to the uh, Rome and to talk, to talk about how things were going. And I sat there complaining, this was not good, that was not good, that was not, blah, 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 blah. And the FAO officer just sort of, Listen to me, he nodded, you know, like a good father. And then he said, well, you know, if everything was perfect, FAO wouldn't have to be there. So FAO works, and the UN works in difficult conditions, in difficult countries where things are not perfect because otherwise they wouldn't have to be there. If you look at this, this is a food system. In the middle... You see inputs, primary production, which is uh, agriculture, and so on, all the way down to domestic food preparation. And you see above and at the two sides influencing factors, shaping forces, institutions that have an impact on whether or not this is successful, whether or not the outcome of all of this activity and a lot of work 
is food security or food insecurity. And it is already a simplified picture. And there are errors in here. There are loops that are not um, yeah, mentioned here because otherwise it gets some kind of spaghetti. Uh, I didn't, didn't want that. But this uh, shows how difficult it is to work on food security if you, for example, only work on agriculture, which is a major issue, but it's only one of the issues that you can influence because all these influencing forces have an impact. So take this into consideration. There are actually, if you look at productivity, remember the 70% increase in, in food that we need to uh, prepare. There are two basic strategies. FAO follows these and a lot of organizations follow these. This is, let's see if this works, uh, increase the potential yield, uh, for example by breeding, for example by using agricultural techniques, irrigation, a uh, much smarter uh, solution is also um, use of uh, GEO-ICT, so GPS controlled systems uh, to, you know, to, to make sure that in this portion of the land you have to put a little bit more fertilizer than in that portion of the land because this is a little bit poorer in some kind of nutrients so that the precision farming uh, takes really um, a, big, um, a big flow. And the other one is um, decrease the yield gap and no, wait. decrease the yield gap uh, especially in countries where the potential yield is way not uh, reached due to pests and diseases, due to poor management practices, due to lack of water, due to lack of knowledge about how to manage uh, a crop. Nutrition security is another one. I'm not going through all of this, but nutrition security, many, many strategies can be followed, and all of them are followed depending on the situation and depending on the stakeholders who are involved. Um, I will not go through all of this, but I will give you one example of where our students from Haas University uh, develop with a number of stakeholders a food intervention strategy for a micronutrient deficiency. Uh, in this case, it's vitamin A, one of the major, the, the big three. Um, and they use, they, so they make it fortified food products. They actually make it. So it's not just a, a piece of paper that they write how to do it, but they actually prepare it themselves and then uh, see how the taste is, how the quality is, etc., etc. So they work on um, a food product uh, that fits into an intervention strategy in, and fits into the food culture of a specific population uh, of a specific country and a specific target group. Very often women and children and elderly people. Another um, project that we are involved in is the so-called Flying Food Project. It's in two countries, Kenya and Uganda. We do this in cooperation with a number of other uh, uh, parties, TNO, for example, um, and they work on... Um, uh, sorry, I think that's mine. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Right. Insect eating. Have ever who who has tried to eat insects before? Okay. Yeah. Quite a few. Oh, quite a few. <laughs> Almost half of, of you, mate. It's actually quite common in a number of countries. It's not so common here. In the Netherlands, we have a, oh, oh. But um, we have to get used to it because this will be one of the protein, important protein sources of the future, uh, also in the Netherlands. Why? Because it is uh, part of the circular economy, because insects eat waste materials. Um, and they eat, for example, the, the, the picture I showed you for the, the food waste, all the um, uh, waste of uh, vegetables and, and fruits, etc., uh, can be eaten by some types of insects. They grow on this and reconvert, upcycle uh, organic waste into uh, high quality, real high quality um, animal um, protein and fats. That in itself can be used in food or in the feed sector, animal feed. At the moment, uh, law is restrictive in the Netherlands. In Belgium, it's already out. So in Belgium you can buy and eat insects. 
Um, in Kenya and Uganda, this is a very rich um, add-on for uh, the, the diets, but what we uh, always do is uh, simulate local entrepreneurship. We believe that a business aspect should be in all our projects. There should be business, there should be some kind of entrepreneurial aspects in this. And then, not just at production, but also at consumption level, uh, we work as Haas University a lot with food producing companies, processing companies, uh, for their CSR policies, their sustainable uh, development co uh, policy, and also to make food production more uh, sustainable in terms of the choice of raw materials, in terms of the process, the water uh, use, energy use, etc. So also at the consumer level, the producer level, at consumer goods, a lot of issues are being um, dealt with. In terms of circular economy, there is lots of nice examples. I chose this one. It's a non-food product. These are asparagus uh, farmers from the eastern part of the Netherlands. Uh, the asparagus, we eat them peeled, and most consumers buy it at the farm, and they peel them for us. But at the end of the day, every uh, day, they end up with a bunch of peels, asparagus peels. So these two thoughts, what can we do with the peels, except for making soup? And uh, they, uh, after some work and research, they made paper out of asparagus peeling. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Many more examples. Okay, some more, a little bit quicker perhaps. What else can we do? We can make clever use of existing horizontal surfaces, such as these rooftop uh, gardens. Very often is it social and a community uh, farming, not so much as the actual production but it brings people back in contact with their food. And as you remember the picture of the supermarket, people in the Netherlands don't have a clue where their food comes from. Not a clue. So we are far away from where it comes to. We are far away from farmers and from agriculture. In fact, people blame farmers for all the bad things that happen with environments, with uh, pollutions, with zoonosis, with all sorts of other issues. Uh, related to agriculture, and it's um, not good because farmers actually produce your and mine food. Ah, with horizontal, <laughs> we can have some nice uh, other uh, issues. Not sure if this is going to make it, but vertical farming, vertical service is going is becoming more and more popular. And I was just judging that in this in this particular room, I think if you put tomato all the way to the top here. Uh, you will be able, after some slight investments, to, to harvest at least 200 kilos per day from this area. So that makes a lot of soup, makes a lot of fresh tomato salad, and it, it's not just the production of it, but it also is a signal to your students and your visitors here that we eat healthy food. Um, um, money problems are over. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Yes. New business model, right. Vertical farming is already a big thing in, the, for example, uh, Singapore, the left side, uh, where they have little lands and a lot of people who want to eat fresh vegetables and can afford to pay it. Uh, the right side of the picture is not a real picture, but it is a compiled picture. Um, it's with less lights, uh, purple lights. Uh, we do lots of research and we think the future will be that in highly populated areas such as big cities, mega cities, uh, fresh vegetable production, fresh food production has to be closer to the people. So we have to find and uh, think of methods that we can do this. Um, and this is called, um, well, we have this climate cells. We call it horticulture 3.0. The first is open field. The second is glass house. And this is number three, uh, where actually we, can, we are able to produce a lot of high quality vegetables, especially leafy vegetables, but also tomato, paprika, cucumbers, etc. we can grow in this system. Uh, you see the lab lights, it's a cooperation with Philips, uh, Philips Lighting, and um, we, can, we are able to make multiple layers. Um, in fact, we just opened last week a big center, uh, it's called a completely growing, completely controlled growing system, CCGS, in Venlo, so you're welcome to have a look. Five layers of vegetable production under LED lights, and we have all sorts of different testing and conditions. So we do research for um, 
for um, companies and for um, actually also for uh, restaurants because this is fully planned. These are our students and actually just before I left to Delft for this uh, meeting I was uh, got a telephone call from uh, somebody from Wageningen, that's the director of the Rockefeller Foundation and the director of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are coming here, plus a number of other people, like the director of AGRA, Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa. Have you heard of this? A uh, big, big um, sort of movement and huge money. Uh, the, the, the two, uh, the two the foundations are really you know, wealthy and making a lot of uh, progress in, uh, in a number of developments and they want to have a, come and have a look. So I'm quite curious, and um, I think they want to invest in this because we are able to put this in a sea container uh, with solar panels at top, so the sea container can put, uh, be put everywhere uh, where there is no water, no electricity, etc. Only you ha have to have the electricity from the solar cells. But in this system, salad, for example, a number of uh, varieties on salad can grow 90% more water effective. Uh, so that means 90% of all water that is poured into the system is actually put into the leaves of the plant. It is absorbed by the plant. It's huge. I've never heard of a system uh, like that. So more crop per job, just as uh, my colleague was mentioning, is a system that, that can help uh, here. Yeah. Okay. But capacity building, of course, is crucial. It's not just technology. And if ever I learned something at FAO, it is that there are three issues, uh, technical, the capacity building, and also the institutional cooperation. Because if you introduce a sea container with this vertical farming system in the desert, you have to have entrepreneurs that invest. You have to have a research station that does research. You have to have an education system that teaches about how this works and you have to have customers who want to buy this. So there's a whole complex of issues that need to be in place before something can be a success. This is FAO uh, farm fields. This is actually Bosnia, um, the after war, war uh, period, where uh, we were actually quite pleased that all the mines have been taken out so that farmers can then start to farm again. Farm field schools in many countries is um, uh, one of the Great examples of an FAO program that's been very, very successful in training people. And uh, here are people who are not in Bosnia, but in Asian countries that cannot read or write. And for the first time in their life, even when they are 50 or 60 years old, they receive, after finishing the farm field school, three months field training, they receive a certificate. The first certificate ever in their life. Can you imagine the empowerment? Yeah, I was in the privileged to be able to um, give the certificate to some of the, um, the, the members of the Farm Field School. And it's unbelievable, the empowerment that, that gives the encouragement. It's great, very good. OK, international cooperation. These are students, international students in our place. Um, and of course, women should have a central um, place in development uh, programs. The left is Congo, and the right is Syria. And in Syria and in Congo, we have, these are FAO programs. This is FAO Farm Field School program. Uh, organize specific farm field schools for women. Yeah, because of um, religious uh, um, issues or just because the women are the ones that grow uh, vegetables. The women are the farmers here, so why train the men if the women are doing the work? So uh, the men get other work. And actually, the concept of farmer field schools by FAO is now transferred into uh, different um, life schools, for example, where they talk and teach about AIDS and transmission of AIDS and all other issues related to the society that are relevant to development. Yes, they are the key to food security. And actually, the North, I mean, and I look at myself, we can learn a lot from the system approaches in uh, developing countries. The integral thinking, we lack this and the broader values related to food and agriculture. Uh, including, we are now talking here in the Netherlands about the 21st century skills that we have to integrate into our educational systems. But actually, if, if you have been out there, if you talk to a, n a number of people, it's already there. It's us who need to learn. All right. I'd say I uh, promised you the take-home message has nothing to do with food and security business. And um, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. 
but I, there are a few things I would like to share, and I share them from my heart. One, the first of all is value farmers. Value farmers and appreciate what they do because they provide your daily bread. So they should be appreciated for what they do in the difficult conditions that they do it in very often. And then I would like to reflect a little bit about sustainable development. Because the sustainable development, in essence, is not just about the practical problems, technological or the economic or the political solution. There's a problem, solution, dang, solved. It's not like that. There's always a next step. And once you're into, once you fully understand the potential of sustainable development, once you, it's not just here, but it's here, there's no way back. It's like Tao. It's like the road is the objective. You always know what to do next. So it's a, it's, it's, it requires the deeper understanding of how people are interrelated, but also what my and your relation is with nature. And I challenge you to take your position, to think about this, and sometimes it takes many years before you actually know the solution. It's not, not a problem, but think about what your position is in relation to the bigger problems in the world and what you want to do. Um, integral way, we have to know, is we have to make some inspiring visions. And if you're in a Western educational system, we teach you to specialize in one topic. But you have to remember that the best professionals, the best professionals have a T-shaped profile. You are a specialist in one area, water, agriculture, gender, but this, this is your key to the world and this is your key to sustainable development. Be able to, to look over your specialization and connect with other fields, with other specializations and integrate that into your work and integrate your field into their work and then we become able to make a system change. Very, very needed, a transition in the agricultural and food production and consumption systems very needed. Sustainable development is part of the problem in that sense. Sustainability, making an existing system a little bit less bad, is not a solution. Eventually, we have to move into another food production and consumption system based on other values. That may take quite a bit. I have not talked about it. I'd love to talk about it, but I take already a lot of time. So I will not, but think about it. And the values are crucial. You can make the change. Thank you very, very much. Um, food for thought, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Um, who would like to um, ask a question to Frederick? Yes. <laughs> Um, I've been involved in all these fields mm -hmm. and I've come to the conclusion that what we should aim at is uh, taking old values and old uh, routines, old traditions, but shaping them up, them up uh, with new technology and new knowledge. So can you feel about I agree. Because if you, if you would say, um, okay, the current system is all rubbish, you've done a bad thing, you know, we have to throw everything away and then start completely new, it's not going to happen. And actually, you're, you, know, you, are, you become outcast. So you have to work with the existing systems, but you have to develop a vision on where you want to go based on values that are broader than economy. Because at the moment, we, uh, our, our indicators are kilos per hectare, ton per hectare. Our kilos are return on investment, uh, cost benefit. These are our, this is our language. It's all about kilos, about money, and we forget about social values, and we forget about environmental values. We talk about people, planet, profit, but we act economy. economy. Yeah. So by you know, using the concept like shared value, important concept, I don't know if you mentioned it, if you heard of him, concept of shared value, you know, social, economic and um, um, 
ecology, ecology values in another way. It's like people paying profit, but it is a business concept. Those are the issues that we need to think about. And we have to make small case studies that prove that this can work. And the interesting thing is the people who want to be in those case studies are the ones that are not, you know, these people, but they are people who, have, who are committed, who want to work and don't mind if they have to work one hour long or, or, or something. And those are the people who are going to make the change. So you have to find your passion. You have to find those, you know, where is it that you, you, you twinkle and you think, yes, this is my field. I want to... That, that feeling. If you find that feeling, go for it. What would your position is nowadays the gene manipulated uh, uh, yeah. people and the present uh, food security issue? Yep. I mean, how am I going to very relevant question. Yes, very, very relevant. Very, um, uh, there is uh, the no camp and there is the yes camp and there is a lot of in between. Yeah. Um, you asked for my personal opinion, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, actually, this is one of the few um, topics that I still teach about GMOs, cis, genetic, uh, transgenic. Uh, um, I tell you my opinion. In um, low tech agriculture, there is no need for GMOs. However, in a lot of areas where there is no other issue, no, no other things possible, such as drought, such as the area I told you in Lebanon and Syria, where there is desert and there's nothing much to do uh, other than growing drought-resistant crops, I believe in those um, um, applications of GMOs. However, I'm very, very uh, reluctant still. Yeah, but you know when you are there and you see the farmer, and you see that there's nothing else for him to do than to pack his bag and move to the big city where he has to live in a slum area, where he, he used to be a farmer for generation after generation. It, um, if, you know, if he can still be a food producer by using these kind of te technologies, not just him that I'm worried about, but it's the 70% and all the... Uh, the there, are li there are even li there are little people uh, at the moment, 50% of us live in cities, and in 2050, 70% of the world population will live in cities, and they are no longer food producers. They are not agricultural, they are not farmers. A few rooftop farmers, but that's, that's not the big bulk. So, it, little people, smaller amounts of people, have to produce food for even a bigger, so we have to use technologies, but I am a little bit reluctant still with GMOs. I think we, uh, maybe yeah, we can okay. discuss this subject even yeah. uh, after, uh, after the conference, uh, when, we, uh, when we have our, uh, our drink and maybe, uh, maybe we're getting some, uh, some insects to eat. <laughs> 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 yeah. yes. But thank you very much, it was very interesting. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Frederick. Thank you for pointing out the importance of being T-shaped. Yes. And I think if you did, if you looked yes. very closely at our MSC participants, you would see that they're T-shaped. <laughs> and you would especially realize that uh, if you spoke to them, because we also, like you, we believe that's incredibly important. Well, for our final presenter of the day, I have the pleasure of introducing my colleague, Professor Charlotte de Frecheur. Charlotte is the head of our chair group in land and water development for food security. And for the master's specialization that accompanies that, as well as I see that Dean Eisenhower is in the room. Also, we have a double degree program in advanced water management for food production with the University of Nebraska. And Charlotte, with other colleagues such as Laszlo, is uh, responsible for that program. Charlotte joined UNESCO IAG in January 2012, really returning home to the Netherlands because she had been working internationally for decades. Prior to coming to UNESCO IAG, she was with the International Water Management Institution, and like our other speakers today, extraordinary international experience. The countries on her list include Senegal, Nepal, 
Colombia, Sri Lanka, Ghana, and most recently before she uh, came to NSYG, she led the, the country program and I think the regional program uh, for Emmy and Burkina Faso. So we're extraordinarily fortunate to have Charlotte leading up all of our efforts in the Institute on this issue of food and water. Charlotte, please. This is the, yeah, this is one. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm, I'm painfully aware that I'm in between uh, here, you and the, and the drinks. So I, I'll <laughs> keep it brief, uh, hopefully. Um, so indeed, I'm, I'm very fortunate to work for UNESCO IT for uh, since three years now. Uh, as it was said, education for water professionals, and uh, as I will show, that we have also an important role in uh, uh, women's uh, issues. All right. Now, first, first something else. I mean, when, when I was just reading The Economist, which, which I think is a very nice newspaper, I came across a, a really interesting article about uh, uh, Enrollment in universities of women, of, of women enrollment in, in universities. And if I explain that figure here, it says storing the ivory towers. You see that on a world average, let me see whether this is working. Yep. Yep, on a world average, you see that there's actually more female enrollment than, uh, than, than men. So there's actually, if, as we speak, in the world, there are more female students. It, at universities than male, univers uh, than male students. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this, the red line, means that there is an equal number, and above it there's more female, and below there's more male. Uh, you see, of course, there's, there's regional differences, but uh, on average, you see that it is going on, actually in all countries it's going up quite steeply, and now we are in a world average, it's, it's actually more female. Now, of course, an easy conclusion would be, yes, of course, I mean, women are more clever, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, the other conclusion of this article was also that, okay, there's more uh, women, if, if women enter the university, they're more likely than men to actually also finish it. Also, in secondary education, women are, do, are doing more, uh, are, are doing better on, in general. But if you take a, a, a closer look to the, to the numbers, you see that women dominate in certain areas. They, they dominate in health, education, arts, and humanity. If you see men, they dominate in engineering, computing, and physics. I thought it's interesting to also see what, what's happening here at UNESCO IG, right, in the, in the number of uh, male and female, and I'm very happy that I got some help from the back office to, to accumulate these numbers. So you see that, well, there's, there's about 41% of the enrollment over the past four years, uh, five years, <coughs> uh, are women. I think this is not bad for, for a technical institute. What's that? It's decreasing. Well, you know, that this is this only one year. I mean, it's, it's, I, I think it's, a, it's you, you cannot really, you, you're not going to really, I mean, it's, it's a little bit tricky to, to take that kind of conclusion from one year. But if you look a little bit closer on the different programs, you see that the MSc enrollment and the ES stands for Environmental Science. You see that, okay, red is the male, a uh, female, and blue is male. So you see that actually, on general, there are more female students in environmental science, except for last year, that's right. <laughs> if you look at the MSc enrollment in water management, so WAM, uh, you see that there's, in, on average, there's more female enrollment. So if you see that the women are the majority in envi environmental sciences and water management. You go to urban water supply, you see that male, are, male students are in the majority. If you look at water science engineering, you see the same thing. So you see that women are a minority in the urban water supply, 34% uh, of the five years, and water science engineering. 
Now, I, I hear you thinking, oh, well, what's new? Of course, men are better in technical, right? In the technical, hard science, etc. Women are excelling in, in the social sciences. But now, here comes a very interesting, so and this is again, I, I go back to the article in the, in the Economist, I can recommend you read it. That she said, well, one starting uh, fact uncovered by the OECD number, cr number crunches is that when teachers mark a reading test without knowing who took it, the gender gap shrinks by one third. So it basically says that, that I mean, by, by knowing whether it's a man or a woman or a girl or a boy in the school, that actually affects the marking. And this is, this is hard science, right? This is OECD uh, 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 study. In the best schools in Shanghai, hardly any youngsters of either sex fail in everything. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. And girls are, mo are almost as good at math as their male classmates and far ahead of the boys elsewhere. And also it says that previous is a continue to hamper girls and boys and it's talking about tenacious stereotypes in education. Now, I'm just also going to talk a little bit, and this was a kind of a, a preliminary, in some similar stereotypes that also may be prevalent in the food and water, en or actually the engineering domain. All right, so, so first, and I think it's all, I have already been said, I mean, food security, of course, is broader than just food production, uh, but there's, of course, there's a physical access to the, the food needs to be physically available, but also people need to have the uh, uh, ways to access it uh, quite often with, with income, sufficient income, and of course, as was emphasized by my colleagues from FAO, Nutrition is a, is a very important part of, of food security. Now, why is water important? We already heard it, but I would like to really briefly uh, uh, repeat it. Uh, crop production is, is, of course, very water intensive. Uh, as, uh, uh, as, as a very rough estimate, it costs about 3,000 liters per person per day to produce our daily food. Uh, well, many of you might, might know this, this kind of numbers. Uh, access to water is quite often a way of income generation, which means if you have income, you can buy food. So that can also make sure food is a clear link with, with food security here. And of course, a balanced diet, a nutritious diet, quite often takes more water to, to, uh, to produce. Uh, another link, and that's with drink water, drinking water, with, with safe drinking water. If you have access to safe drinking water, you're quite often you're more healthy. If you're more healthy, uh, your body will uh, absorb the nutrients more easily, and that's another link with, with uh, food security. So it's no exaggeration that you can say that water uh, it has a very important uh, link with food security, and then in particular also with, with irrigation. Uh, you see here a, in the left uh, hand corner, you see the uh, you see a veg vegetable garden uh, irrigated. Uh, you see there a woman uh, with also irrigated vegetables. Uh, in the left-hand corner below, you see the, uh, some uh, solar panel uh, pumping uh, and, and another uh, uh, drip irrigation, which I, which I will talk about uh, just after a few slides. So, as I said, I would like to talk a little bit about the male dominance in food security. And here I borrow from my uh, colleague, uh, Margrethe Zwartebein, who did actually quite some very, very interesting work on this. So she's basically saying that, that there's a male dominance in, in the water for food security, or actually in the engineering domain, in three aspects. First is that on the local level, you see the land and water rights uh, are often held by men. Uh, access to uh, natural resources is unequal for men and women. 
Though women provide labor and agriculture, they quite often lack the decision-making power, and they are also underrepresented in, in Water Users Association. So this is a domain, and I think my, my colleagues from the FAO talked about it. Here in this, there has been a lot of work and a lot of uh, new data has, has been generated and, and a lot of new insights have been generated. So here in this domain, there's a, a lot has happened over the, over the past decades. Now, if you go a little bit more closer to, to, uh, to us, basically, uh, our, the level that we are working in, you see that the professional irrigation domain, and I can, it's not just irrigation, but it's also the engineering domain, I would say. And engineering, of course, has a very strong link with, with uh, uh, water and food security, is male-dominated. So the irrigation professionals, or, or even the drinking water engineers, or the, the engineering professions, they are the experts, the engineers, the planners, the policies, are predominantly men. And then a third aspect that she mentioned, which, which I'm not going to talk about, is that knowledge and studies in irrigation is mostly produced by men. And they highlight uh, the activities and they attach, of course, the value that are typically associated with men. Okay, let me, let me talk, talk about the, the first aspect. So, land and water rights and access to natural resources and the need for women's visibility in agricultural <laughs> activities. So, there has been over the past decades in, in different uh, shapes, the, the, the women in development, the, the water and, and no, the gender and water. Uh, there's, there's, there's many, many uh, uh, initiatives that have been on, on gender or women, and w women in water. Uh, so there's, there has been a lot of awareness of the women's importance in, in water and food production. So the gender analysis, the gender data, the disaggregate, we have heard the toolbox that, that FAO is, has, has developed is really contributed to, to this kind of dom domain on the, on the awareness of, of women's importance in, in water and food. Now, of course, I mean, quite quickly, it's, it was clear that awareness alone would not help much, would not change much. So then, I mean, came the gender mainstreaming in, in activities, the empowerment, the interventions targeted to women farmers, and the catering to their needs uh, and activities. So I, I give you three examples, uh, in, in, of course, in the, in the water and food domain. One is treadle pumps. Who knows what treadle pumps are? So a few of them, yeah, not, not all. Drip kits and, and some quota in, in, in water users associations. Those are three elements that, that have been used in the, in the water and food domain to increase uh, the, uh, the, the participation of women in, in agriculture, or in actually the importance of women in agriculture. So travel pumps. They are, for those who don't know, that those are those, well, I mean, who goes to the gym here every now and then? <laughs> okay, this is, this is a difficult question, but anyway, they're, they're step masters, right? I mean, this, uh, so it's actually, it looks like a step master. And uh, so, so you see this guy here as well. It's, 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 a, it's a, a manually driven pump. So by stepping like this, you can pump up the water. What's that? Uh, yes, that's right. Yes, it's a feed-driven pump. You're right. <laughs> I, I have a picture of a, of a hand-driven pump as well, so, but you, you're right. This is a feed-driven pump. So, uh, uh, so you, you can pump from, from five meters uh, groundwater, more or less. And uh, so the attributes are they are affordable, uh, they're cheap, the, they don't need petrol, you don't need diesel, uh, 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 there can be locally manufactured, they're easy to operate, to maintain, and quite often there's also kind of programs for, 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 for women groups, for credits, to get them, etc., etc. So you see that they are really marketed as, as being a tool for, uh, particularly for women. For example, the IDE, IDE is a, an NGO, 
Uh, there are this, these are just plucked from the internet. It's just a great tool, internet. You can just uh, basically <laughs> copy paste, uh, y and you see here the picture of, of a smiling woman uh, traveling herself out of poverty. As, as they are, uh, how, uh, this is how it is uh, uh, adver advertised. Another is Kickstart. Kickstart is another NGO doing basically much of the same thing. Uh, here, you see, I mean, here, here the woman, this is a, actually manually, uh, this is like a, what, what we, a feed pump, yes, I, I, you say that, a, a pump for, for uh, uh, what's, what's it, bicycle pump? Yeah, okay, bicycle pump, thank you, that is, uh, so it's basically the same principle also as a, as a bicycle pump, but then you don't push the air, but you suck the water, basically. So you see that, that these are, uh, an, another example is, is, is drip kits. Drip, drip kits is also it's kind of the same uh, cheap, affordable, uh, small, easy to install uh, uh, technologies. So this is a, for example, a bucket kit. It's 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 well one meter high. You put a bucket. Uh, you see here. It's not working. It's a little bit too small here. But anyway, so you see here the bucket. You see here, you see the, you see here the the, the pipe. It's, it's basically a tube. There's very very small holes in it, and by the pressure, it drips. Uh, the, the, hence the name drip kit. It drips. The, the little drops are just getting exactly where by by a little plant. So it's a very efficient way of of irrigating. Uh, this is actually a, a very simple version of, of a, well, you s and I, I think the, the talk in Haas, you have a very, in the Netherlands we also have this system, very sophisticated, uh, well, the pressure, etc. So, so computer, computer, uh, computerized, uh, but this is, this is the very simple, simplified version of a, uh, a much more technical uh, uh, invention. So this is another one, and you see that also the drip kits are really a tool for poverty alleviation, specifically for, for women. So you see here uh, advertise in, in Nepal, big changes come in small kits, so you see that it is really uh, drip irrigation is, is providing women and disadvantaged farmers in Nepal with new livelihoods opportunities. You see here another picture, it's not very good quality, but the one, one in the, the, the right-hand side is, is in Ghana, where there's very, a, a big promotion for, for this kind of... Uh, now, I was talking about assumptions and prejudices, right? So women need simple, affordable, and flexible technologies. And this picture, you can see that uh, the, uh, the, some, so this, this actually I took also from somebody and I nicked it from somebody else, uh, from uh, Leonard the Wolfram, who gave a, uh, a presentation on simple technologies and he had said, this is an affordable technology, right? You don't need petrol, you, well, it's, it's, it's basically a, a, a simplified version of a car. Do you enhance prejudice to, I think, men need it as well? Yes, you see, that's exactly what it is, but... Uh, but you see that, that in, indeed, I mean, it's also targeted to, to, to men as well, poor men, like small farmers. And actually, the same, there the same prejudices are, are, are valid. That, uh, but you see that it is really, as I showed on the website, it's really targeted to women as well, in particular. So, okay, so many of these technologies actually proved in, in practical, and women can very well handle technology and, and also there's a question of, of uh, economic feasibility here there's also women are agriculture entrepreneurs and that's quite often the case but I mean if you look at the uh, subsistence farmers they could also be often small family affairs right so, so you, you basically don't look at the individual women or the individual men but you should actually see them as, uh, as, as, as a family, or actually as a division of, of labor and, and roles. So you see also that activity for women, are quite often they are organized in groups or in cooperatives. 
And again, also the, the examples that I showed for the drip and for the, the drip kits and for the trailer pumps, you see that, that they are, women are quite often approached as, as a group. And you see that those groups fall apart after project ends. Then you see that, that I, I, uh, the, you see often that there's targets in, in projects. For example, the number of wi women in Water Users Association in Nepal is one directive that 30% of the, of the uh, members of the Water Users Association should be women. Now you see that most targets are either not achieved or quite often they're just on paper, so kind of the top-down doesn't really work. Now, let me, let me go to the second aspect on the, on the professional irrigation domain is male-dominated. Uh, so irrigation professionals are often experts, uh, or the, the, the are, are often uh, uh, male. Now you see that already a little bit here, right? In the in the in it's, it it's actually start already in the in the enrollment in the in the university, but also, and this is one study that was done in in the district in the irrigation offices in in Nepal. Uh, you see that, that if you look at the total staff, there are 148, and there are 19 male uh, staff, so it's actually uh, a minority. But also if you look at where they are, in the T1, that's say the highest level, that's the engineer, there's only one. And the administrative staff, there's a few more, but, but also in this particular organization, it's, it's, uh, 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 it, it's, it's actually a, a quite low. I have another one just for a second. So, so what, what, what is also an aspect here is that, is that for, for women, engineering is, is not the obvious choice. But if, if, and, and they did quite some interviews also on, on uh, women, in, in, and they basically said they had always had to explain something on why you are an engineer or why you have a technical... And you see also that the people working in the, in the district irrigation uh, offices, the women working there, they always have to explain something like that. You, know. and you see also that, that they're not only in the lower uh, part, but, but quite often that they interviewed quite a few people. And the, the few women that, that were working in, in the office, they said, well, we always have to do the administrative work, or we are kind of quite often we are, uh, or if there's a gender work to be done. And then you know it was th th they always had to it went also to the to the same same person there. So uh, what they did next, and this this is uh, I hope it's going to provoke a little bit of discussion here, is that uh, uh, they they basically based on the on interviews with with the in the, the engineers there. They ask them, you know, what, what are now the attributes and what are now the characteristics of, of typical engineers? And you see that typical engineers, you see that there is, if you, if you want to kind of put it a little bit black and white, you can see that there is a, uh, a little bit of, of compatibility with what many people uh, see as, as male or, or, or man values or, or uh, values that typically are, are feminine. So you see that, that uh, in the, the men were the engineers, you know, that those are people who calculate and, uh, equations, etc. While women, they look more at values and options, technical versus social, hard, soft, strong, weak well, correctable and honest and decent, which is also quite interesting here. <laughs> but uh, uh, ra rational, emotional, daring, uh, timid, uh, leading, following, etc. hardware, software. So you see that there is actually, in the, in the engineering, there's this kind of, uh, well, the, what, what, what uh, the, the text says, the masculine, uh, uh, masculine world, world and masculine values will dominate. So, mm. 
interestingly, you can also see that if you see in the, in the CEOs in, 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 in the, and why uh, women are, are not kind of, you know, remember the first slide, right? I mean, 60% of the women are, are actually, uh, uh, sorry, 60% uh, of, the, of the students enrolled in universities worldwide are women. But you don't see, they don't kind of, in the higher positions, you, you hardly see them. So you, you can, yeah, you, in, in the engineering, you see that, that there is a dominance of, as I said, the mus masculine values uh, in the workplace. So there's a lot of emphasis in, in district irrigation offices, in ir district, uh, sorry, in irrigation offices. There's an emphasis on design, on construction, on, on uh, numerical tar targets, on calculation, on modeling, on numbers. And so there's an emphasis on, on engineering aspects. And there's much less room and also much less respect, I would say, for the social, the soft, ecological values. Also, it's quite normal to work long hours. Uh, there's, there's kind of different opinions on, on what is the right uh, work-life balance, uh, hence fa and balancing family or, or leisure time and work. Another uh, element that, that came from, so women are actually not fit for, for field work. That was one of the opinions of, of, the, of the people there. And female uh, engineers, as I already said, female engineers, they do more work and are more involved in, in engineering tasks. So this, this was a, uh, a, a study that had been done in an uh, in, in irrigation uh, office in, in Nepal. But I think that many, the same is still true for, for maybe many of the workplaces that, that uh, female engineers are, are working. Mm. So, to, to close off, I mean, you see, as I said, I mean, the enrollment of, uh, of, of uh, students is, is not, is, is, it probably is, is a necessary condition, but is not a sufficient condition for, uh, um, uh, for, for uh, women e equality at, at the workplace, and in particular in the water for food and the engineering field. Now, last slide. I don't know, if, I don't know whether uh, Aline is here, but I... What? Aline, is she here? No. no, okay, anyway, but, but I would recommend you go to the website and you click on her face, and then you get a really nice interview with her, and I, I really enjoyed that. It was really a, a nice, uh, uh, a nice interview, and I think many of the aspects that I talked about actually also surface in her interview as a female engineer. So, with that, I would like to close my, uh, my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have run over by a few minutes, but it would be great if we could take one or two at the most questions to finish off our time together here, and then uh, Laura can invite us to go downstairs and continue the conversation in a reception format. We have one or two questions. Yes? Uh, in the Department of uh, Water Engineering, there are less than 30% of women. This is a comparison about male, female and male, including it also in the age in the school. Then uh, my question is, uh, is how to motivate women to interest in the harder uh, science? Okay, so, so actually uh, that is, I, I did not delve too deep into that research that I, I was there. That this is a, uh, the slide was a, from an OACD uh, study. And, and basically, they said that, that uh, they or they hypothesized that it could be very small things, right? I mean, even you know, uh, as I said, I mean, the teachers grading differently to men and women, right? I mean, women they, they were you know they were grow, graded la uh, less in, in uh, mathematics and, and higher in uh, in languages. And uh, so they basically they say, okay, even you know if 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 if, uh, if, if blind grading would already help because it is really demotivating for for women uh, to and, and also kind of encouragement 
from from colleagues and in the workplace, and uh, so that you, that women don't have to explain. Okay, yeah, I'm I'm an engineer. I'm sorry, I'm an engineer. So that they don't have to explain. Uh, so so it, c it could be very small encouragement and, and uh, to uh, that, that that women can actually. Um, and I think also in Aline's, she, she actually made also made in her interview, she, she actually alluded to that. And she said, well, what is also very important is, is a, uh, a, a role models. She was saying that, that in the beginning there were only very few women. But after other women saw that, okay, yes, you can do uh, uh, more technical science studies, then more women were, were following. So I, I, I think it is it is possible to, to encourage the, the other the other thing is I mean in the workplace I think also I mean it, it, it maybe it's it, it's not a bad idea to to start thinking about the corporate culture or the, the, the office culture and is that conducive to everybody? Is that inclusive to everybody? And I think that's that's also a part that that uh, the second part that I showed uh, the set, the second element of male dominance in, in engineering and in science that it could be very well that that there is a corporate culture that women don't feel so so well at home. So that could be a second element of it. Thank you. We'll have a final yeah. question here. It's it's a it's a much deeper underlying problem that you cannot just solve with simple uh, technology. But where do you think it's based? Is it based in the men or in the women? <laughs> I, I no I no 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 I I think it's in society and it's it's I think it's also a useless well with all due, due respect. A useless uh, discussion to start. Okay, whose fault is it, or who should work on it, or or I, I, I think it's 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 both. I mean, uh, I uh, and maybe people are happy with this, so maybe we should not change. That's I'm not, but I mean that that could also be. Uh, uh. Yes. Yes. Thank you for the nice story. Thank you for the story. What I was surprised about was that you were when you were talking about. <laughs> Yeah. And you always see these not very sophisticated, maybe easy access accessible technologies. I always become a bit angry when I see it because yes. I think why are there not better, more yeah. sophisticated yeah. sophisticated technologies, less labor intensive technologies available? <laughs> Oh, no, not at all. I'm, no, no, no. I'm, I'm highly critical of it. Okay, oh, sorry. Then, then I, I. Oh my God. <laughs> okay. I, I hope I was clear in the rest of my, my messages. No, I'm, I'm highly critical of it. 
No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm highly, highly critical of it, and, and uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm actually. It, it was for me. It was assumptions to prejudge. Ju, ju, I, I can't pronounce that word. Prejudice. Prejudice. So, what's that? That slide needs improvement. It is not very clear. Oh, okay. Okay. No. Thank you. Then, uh, for next. Okay. We are on the same page. Yes. Yes. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, next, next, uh, I'll, I'll improve my slide. Thank you. I want to give a concrete example with the treasure pumps. We had a project in uh, Zimbabwe where we wanted to help with the irrigation. And we decided to... Yeah, I'm not sure everyone can hear you in the back. You want to come here in the, with the microphone? <laughs> we had a project with treasure pumps in Zimbabwe. And we saw the treasure pumps were the solution. But then uh, we didn't involve women in the consultation process. And actually, in those communities, the treasure pumps with this movement, like a bicycle, had like a sexual connotation. And so when they finally the treasure pumps were given, the women didn't want to use them. And so they said, no, 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 we get into trouble. And so the treasure pumps were sitting there, I don't know how many, hundreds of them, in a little storage room for months, until one of the women of the village said, you know, I think I have a solution. What they did, they dig a big hole, they put the treadle pump below, and so when you were driving on the road, you would just see the head of the women because all the rest was below, and they were doing this movement. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need to consider what is the local context and if they can do it or not. Sometimes it's just a matter of consulting them and say, is this technology acceptable, more or less sophisticated? What can we do about it? I remember in Cape Verde, they did a fantastic irrigation system and they didn't ask who was supposed to go and turn the pump on. And they forgot to ask again. And the women were supposed to do it. And they set up the system so at 7 in the morning the women were supposed to go and turn the pump. But they couldn't because at that time they were preparing breakfast and setting up the kids to go to school. If you had consulted them again, you would have been able to do it. Or they were saying, oh, uh, uh, criticize and so on. I remember once we gave, we wanted to give after the tsunami, uh, what were the um, hand tractors? And then we immediately we got a lot of donors after the tsunami who wanted to give us, and we bought hundreds of these hand, uh, these, uh, hand uh, tractors. The government couldn't decide how to distribute them. And those things stay for almost a year in a storeroom before they could be distributed. Even the seeds we got, improved variety of seeds, they were germinating because they couldn't find out uh, between the different institutions, shall we give it to the community? How many communities shall we give it to the household? And not, and there were hundreds of messages and it took about a year. The plants were germinating and the hand tractors were given almost a year later to the people who needed them. Well, after the tsunami, they said, oh, we need to give the boats to the fishermen. How do we do it? They couldn't decide what material to put these damn boats when they had to reconstruct them. And it took, I don't know, how many months. And meanwhile, the people had to ask loans to survive and because they couldn't go fishing and so on. So context can be very complicated at times. The intention might be very good, but then you don't consult the people or maybe they don't want to agree how to do it. So... Not an easy task. Thank you, and I apologize because I see there's some other hands, and I know there's great interest. There's so much to discuss here. We had three very provocative presentations. We've had very challenging questions. This is a topic that's, uh, that we could discuss for a great deal longer, and we'll be working on it for a great deal longer. We do have some extra time, so I hope that you will, uh, with your unanswered questions, perhaps approach the person who you, your question is directed to, and we can continue the discussion. But now I'll hand it back over to Laura. Um, yes, actually, Michael, why don't you stay on stage? Okay. And uh, why, why doesn't uh, Marit Verhoef join you as well? Because uh, to show our appreciation for the speakers, we have a small token for them. Oh, these are beautiful. If I could ask all three speakers to come to the stage. <laughs> Um, yeah, with this, we, we would like to thank you for speaking for us. And um, after this is done, there's a reception downstairs. So we'll meet you all in the restaurant. And you can't see these, but they're beautiful books entitled Women of the Water. And they're photographs. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, I hope you'll all be able to join us downstairs in the restaurant for some drinks, and I'm sure you have many, many more questions to ask for the speakers. So we'll meet you there.